Well, good morning. If you're here in your vehicle or you're sitting underneath one of our pop-ups, you're watching online today, or maybe my voice is just carrying and you're listening, we welcome you to Hillside Assembly today. We're going to have an amazing time of worship, an encouraging time in God's Word, and I believe hearts and lives will be changed today before we leave this place together. My name is Eric. I am the lead pastor here, and if you'd like to know more about our church, you can always check us out on the web at hillsideassembly.org. We also have some free gifts for anybody that's a visitor today. We would love to put those in your hands, so talk with us after service. We do have bottled water available over here in our cooler uh, by our giving tube. You can go and get that anytime that you want during the service. Just walk up, go over and grab it. Just be careful of our cameraman. He would greatly appreciate that. Uh, but grab that water if you need it. Uh, it's there to be a blessing to you. Uh, if you want to give tithes and offerings today, you can do so in our giving tube at the end of service. It's right over there. It's the white tube. And uh, we appreciate when you give to the Lord. We'll pray over our offering at the end of service today. Uh, a couple of quick things to make mention of when you leave today. For those of you who are parked down here, we would ask that you exit out on Union Street over here to my right, your left. Uh, that would be great. As we tear down, we want to make sure everybody remains safe today. Uh, a couple of other announcements to make mention of. The church office will be closed Monday and Tuesday, so no office hours Monday and Tuesday this week. Saturday, July 16th, we've got a ladies' gathering. Uh, women, come on out. Enjoy us. It's going to be an inspiring time that morning. It's from 10 a.m. to 11.30. Paulette Biffert will be our guest speaker, and that will be in the upper level. Uh, so don't miss out on that Saturday, July 16th. Friday, July 22nd, we have Westward Road. They'll be doing a gospel concert right here at Hillside. We do have some promotional materials to put into your hands for that. So you can see uh, any of our leaders will make sure to give you those. We can make more posters and cards. If you want more, just let us know. Uh, we'll have those available for you. Again, that's a free concert. There will be a free will offering at the intermission, and that will take place in our sanctuary on July 22nd. And then finally, don't forget, VBS and camps are right around the corner. We'd love your help with that. There's more information in your bulletin, but if you have questions about uh, VBS, Jackie's the best person to ask. And if you have questions about camp, it would be Hannah, Adrian, or my wife. They'd all be willing to help you uh, with questions about camp. Well, who's ready to worship this morning? A couple of you. Uh, we're going to have some fun today because it is the holiday weekend. We're headed into the 4th of July. Uh, and we've got a little bit of interaction today. You guys get to play a part in, uh, in our sermon illustration, so we'll have some fun with that. We're going to have a great time with God. If you're sitting outside of your vehicle, would you stand really quick? Because we want to take a moment just to ask God's presence here today. He's been doing so many great things. Lord, we thank you today that, God, you've given us another amazing Sunday to gather together outdoors to share the gospel message. Lord, to lift our worship to you and, and for our community to see people engaged in a relationship with you. It's so important. Lord, I pray today that the word would be spoken, the, the songs would be sung, and you would minister to somebody's heart. Somebody who's passing by, out for a walk, maybe on a trail back here, or, or perhaps maybe down at one of our businesses off Main Street, that they've opened their windows and they can hear the music that we're singing and the words that are spoken. And through that, Holy Spirit, you would do something great. Because God, I know that you long to call people and draw people closer to you, to bring freedom to the captive, to restore things that have been stolen, to step into the middle of messes that sometimes we've created with our own hands. But Lord, you have solutions and ways to bring us out of the mess that we find ourselves in. God, we just invite you here to this campus today on a hillside assembly out here in this lawn and across our city today. God, would you interact with us? Would you connect with us? Lord, we want to worship you with the right heart, with the right spirit as we surrender our life. And Lord, as we focus on you, God, do something great today. And God's people said, amen. Amen. You can remain standing or seating, whatever feels best to you. I'm going to turn it over to Robbie and our worship team this morning to open us up with some worship. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. 
No, I worked harder than all men, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Are you thankful for the, his amazing grace today? Let's sing it. This is amazing grace. you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free For oh, Jesus I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be. you've done for me. All that you've done for me. Oh, just give the Lord your worship right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes to see your holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Jesus, you are 
worthy of our worship. Sing it out to him. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Again, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. God, we worship you. Sing a new song. We sing our song to you. Creation, I say, praise 
Maybe you came with a heavy heart. Maybe there's been things going on in your life this last week, situations, circumstances beyond your control. Maybe it was a mess that you made by your own decisions, and today you just feel weighed down by these things, things that you don't have answers for. Maybe you just need God to speak into your life in this moment, to move obstacles or to give you the, the strength and the power to be able to continue to walk through the path that you're on this morning. God wants to reach you right now in this moment. Lord, I pray for all of those who came with heavy hearts, with situations and circumstances that are beyond their control. And Lord, those who just need your help to make it through this next phase in their life. God, this morning, may you show up and do something absolutely amazing. You're a God of miracles. You're a God who shows up and you're a God who has answers. And today, God, we pray to step into your presence as we transition to the preaching of your word. God, change, transform our lives today. Encourage us, move in our hearts and minds. We give you praise, glory, and honor. And God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I know we have lots of people that are traveling to this weekend. We're praying for you. Someone said, I'm going to be watching online or shortly after today. So, hey, we're glad that you're able to do that today and those who are joining us uh, online. Uh, Man, I'm excited to preach the word today. Uh, If you're a guest here, you might be wondering, what is the deal with with this big horse trough over here? Well, we believe really strongly that when you get saved, that the first thing that God asks us to do is get baptized as a sign to say, I'm all in with Jesus. And we believe in full immersion baptism, which means we go under the water and we come back up. There's nothing magical about the water, but it's a, it's a statement to say to everybody, I have chosen to follow Jesus, and I'm going to do my very best to be obedient to him. If you've not been water baptized a, a, as an adult or a child where, where you were able to make that decision, we're not talking about infant baptism here because a baby can't make that decision. Uh, but if, you have a, if you're an adult, a teenager or a child, and you've decided to follow Jesus and you haven't been water baptized, today would be a great opportunity. And you might say, I don't have towels. I don't have a change of clothes. We have all of that for men and women, multiple sizes. Uh, We've got that available at the end of service. We'll give you that opportunity. But if God begins to stir on your heart and speak to you to go, today's the day you should get baptized. We will make it happen. We've got a team here ready to assist you. I promise you it won't be scary, and believe me, it's not going to be the craziest thing that you see today, uh, because we've got some crazy stuff planned for our message. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids at this time. Miss Jackie is ready. Uh, If you have kiddos, I know that there's some over there. Any kiddos here that want to go, you're welcome to join Miss Jackie. And uh, parents, we're going to have you pick up kids today on top of the hill. Uh, So they're going to have a great time at Kids Church today. Well, we're going to jump into the Word. We're going to be in the book of Judges this morning. The book of Judges is absolutely fascinating. It has this unique pattern that we begin to see emerge. You've got God's people, and they are following God. They're they're sold in. They're ready to go. They're all about following Jesus. They're worshiping Him. They're, They're obeying Him, and they're being fruitful. Great things are happening. But then, as a generation or so goes by, they begin to 
just fall away from God. They begin to, to, to not be as obedient, to not be as passionate, to lose contact with God, and, and prayer doesn't become a high priority, and, and they find themselves in a mess. So you've got them following God, then they stray from God, and then they find themselves, they get into a mess, they get oppressed by another people, and then God raises up a person to come along, and that's known as one of the judges, to come along and to get God's people back on track and to lead them back to the place of freedom in God. So I want to pick up with one of these people this morning who God raised up, and it's Gideon. And the question that we want to answer this morning is this. Does God know what he's doing? Now, look, I know a lot of you would go, of course God knows what he's doing, because you have amazing faith. It's so big, it's so huge. You never question God on anything, I'm sure. Um, Look, we have all been there. And I think it's fascinating that we look at so many great men and women in the Bible, and while they don't use that same phrase, they often ask the same question. God, do you know what you're doing? Look at Moses and Esther. They're like, uh, no, this can't be God's plan. What is God possibly doing? This can't, God must not know what he's doing. Uh, we see Noah, and we see others, and today we walk into the footprints of another man, Gideon, who almost literally asked the question, God, do you know what you're doing? Let's jump into Judges chapter 6, verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites uh, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkey. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them for their, for their camels, uh, to count them or their camels. They invaded the land and ravaged it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. They were in such desperate need that they finally turned to God and said, Lord, we need your help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hands of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship any gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have, listened, but you have not Listen to me. Now, God could have stopped right there and just said, look, this is why you're in this mess. But he doesn't. Because God doesn't stop with saying, hey, this is how you got here. God has a plan to get you out. Verse 11 picks up, and it says this, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Orpha that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite. When his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. There's much more to this story, but for today, we're going we're gonna to just focus in on this, and Lord willing, we'll pick up with Gideon's story next week to see what the next steps are in this process. I think all of us have probably heard the phrase, appearance can be deceiving. Isn't that true? Sometimes it's not the way that we, we see it. An example of that is this story that I found this week. In, ni- in 1884, a young man died, and after his, the funeral his grieving parents decided to establish a memorial to him. 
With that in mind, they met with Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard University. Eliot received the si these simple dressed couple into his office and asked what he could do for them. After they expressed their desire to fund a memorial, er uh, Eliot uh, suggested, perhaps you have in mind a scholarship. Well, we are thinking of something more substantial than that, perhaps a building, the woman replied. Eliot brushed this aside. The idea of, be, of building this expensive building for this simple couple seemed far out of reach. The couple ended up departing the office after a lengthy conversation. The next year, Eliot learned that this, this pair had gone somewhere else and established a $26 million memorial named the Leland Stanford Junior University, better known today as Stanford. A missed opportunity because someone couldn't see past the surface level. And I think when it comes to the kingdom of God, there are a lot of things that God does that are below the surface level, things that you and I cannot see and sometimes we can't even understand. Our minds can't grasp the things that God can grasp and see the things that God can see. But I will tell you this, God often sees our circumstances, our situations different than we perceive them. This passage that we read this morning, we see that God's people are oppressed by the Midianites. The Bible says a few things about this. They prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. They were scared of these people. They realized if you got in their way, they plowed you over, and they left nothing for the people. They ravaged the land. And so the people would, would build these fortresses and places and, 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 and cliffs and caves and valleys to, to stay out of their way and to hide from them. Every time that these Midianites and other peoples would come in with their livestock, they would trample the ground, ruining their crops, their resources. The Bible says that they didn't leave a living thing for the Israelites, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. So any of their livestock, any of the animals that they had, had to go with them to these, to these protected places. Otherwise, they would be gone, killed. The Israelite people were no match. They were outnumbered and overwhelmed. And this led to a simple choice. They could stay where they're at in their oppression. They could stay in this place of the same cycle over and over and over again. All their hard work ruined year after year after year. Or they could turn their hearts and they could reach out for God. And they chose to do that. They began to pray and to cry out to God for his mercy. God sends a prophet who speaks to them with a message. And, and the prophet's message was, hey, this is why you're in this mess in the first place. But behind the scenes, God is doing something greater. And he's got his eye on an individual because God doesn't stop by just telling us about us, our mess. God wants to step in and help us out of our mess. And if you're in a mess today, God has a plan for you to get you out of it. Whether you're in a mess by your own decision or a mess that has nothing to do with your actions whatsoever, God has a way out and God is ready to help you this morning. Unknown to anybody else in Israel, God had his eye on a specific leader, a person named Gideon. God's choice for the next judge was this guy, but none of us would pick Gideon. Let's take a look at this passage of scripture again and just some quick things to, to take in, into this uh, as we look at Gideon's life. Verse 11 says, the angel of the Lord came, sat down underneath the oak tree uh, that belonged to Joash, his father, where Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Well, you've got to understand a little bit about a wine press and how they were built back in the days of Israel in the time of Gideon. Uh, wine presses, they often put into the ground. They dug down several feet, lined it, and, and that's where they, they, they built the wine. And then they often built walls around it that were a few feet high. And, and the problem with that is this that when you're threshing wheat, you take the wheat and you're supposed to take it outside. You put it on a hard surface. You beat it against the ground. You rub it in your hands. And then there's a breeze. 
and the breeze blows the chaff away. Oh, not as impressive as he thought it would be. Because there's not a lot of wind here. There's a little bit by our fan. But the whole idea was to take that and it would take the chaff away and you were able to get the good grain that was left over. But Gideon's in a wine press. And, and for the most part, he's almost inside. If I could have Adrian and Hannah come help me for a second up here. And so the reason that the wine press was built down into the ground was because you didn't want uh, things that the wind would blow into your wine. You didn't want those things, so it would protect it. This is where we find Gideon threshing his wheat. And so all you'd see from the walls of, that were around this wine press was occasionally there would just be a, a puff over here and a puff over here, and, and that would be it. And Gideon is inside this thing. So when he steps out, this is what the angel saw. He steps out of the wine press, and he's like, the angel's there, and he's like, greetings, mighty warrior. He's like, hold on a second. Because this isn't the picture that I get when I think of a mighty warrior. I mean, all of us like the summer movies, right? And, and if we're looking for someone to free the Israelites out of captivity, we're looking for an action hero. You know, where's the rock at? Uh, where's Sylvester Stallone? That kind of thing. Instead, we get the comedic actor coming out. I mean, you all laughed the minute I stepped out of the tent. I mean, the angel probably had to fight back in some laughter a little bit. Look, I got like flour in my pocket. Man. I don't want to jump into the baptismal and make a giant donut. <laughs> Here he is. He's covered in dust. Because he wanted to hide from the Midianites. It's not like he was like, oh, I'm not scared of these guys. I'll just go out and do it right out in the open. No, he was, he was hiding, which was probably made sense because anybody else that was doing this stuff outside, they'd come along and steal it and maybe even kill them. The angel greets him, Lord, or the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And it must have made Gideon wonder, God, do you know what you're doing? Because look at the next thing Gideon says. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look. Uh, uh, sorry, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says this. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height or his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not a man how man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at his heart. This is, of course, talking about David. Because he, was, he wasn't what people thought of as a king either. That same type of, of, of heartbeat for God is now shown in Gideon. God's not looking at the dusty exterior. He's looking at something deeper. God saw something in Gideon that probably Gideon didn't even see in himself. God wasn't looking at the dusty outside. God wasn't even looking at the gifts that Gideon had, his talents. God was looking at a heart. And in Gideon, he saw a man that was willing to be obedient. A man who was willing to follow. And that was enough for God. God's not looking at your external today. God's not even looking at your gifts and abilities. God is looking for hearts today in our culture. Look at how Gideon responds to the angel. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when, he, when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of, up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us over to the hands of Midian. And I want to tell you, that phrase right there, we could replace just a couple words, and I guarantee you, that's the heart of a lot of Christians today in our culture. Where is God? What happened? Where are the wonders that they used to talk about? Why aren't we seeing God do more? There's probably a bunch of people right here today that are watching. 
I've got flour going everywhere. Uh, there's probably a bunch of people here walking who feel that this way today. I mean, look at the times and the mess that we're in all around us. Crime is on the rise in almost every major city across our country. 50 plus people were killed in a human, tra or human trafficking incident just in the last week. Inflation, gas costs all on the rise. We bought two pieces of wood today. I couldn't believe how much money we had to spend for two pieces of wood. It was crazy. We've got war in the Ukraine, rumors of war all over the place. And that's not to say any of the personal struggles that each one of us have and the things that are happening in our very own community. There's all sorts of craziness going on. And people are wondering, where are the wonders of God? And has God abandoned us? But the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. I need to sneeze so bad and I can't get it to come. Uh, in the strength you have, am I not sending you? I love Gideon's response here. Pardon me, excuse me. <laughs> Pardon me, God. But do you know what you're doing? But God looks at him and says, go in the strength you have. Go in the strength you have and save Israel. Man, this must seem totally crazy because Gideon's thinking to himself, I'm not Superman. I'm not Spider-Man. I don't have a suit to put on like Iron Man. I don't have strength like the Incredible Hulk. How in the world Am I supposed to do this? What strength are you talking about? It's just me. Thank you. I feel Gideon's pain. Go in the strength that you have. What strength? It's just dusty Gideon. And then Gideon goes on to say, pardon me, Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my family. But the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites. This dusty guy who doesn't have anything, who feels by himself, doesn't fit into his own family. We'll find out more about that next week, but here he is, and he's just, he feels like, I've got nothing. Yet God goes, I've chosen you to stand up and be the miracle. You're the person I want to work through and do things in. You're the guy. Go in the strength you have. Worship team, if you'd come, get ready. A lot of people have been asking the questions. Where are the miracles? We want God to reach our city, reach our community. We always talk about, oh, we want to see revival. We want, we want to experience. But you know what? I think sometimes those prayers have come off kind of cheap in God's presence. Don't get me wrong. He hears the cries, and I believe he wants to respond to them. But the answer he's sending is not the answer that you might be envisioning. Because for many of us, we feel like we cry out, we want more God, more God, more God. And all we want to do is just sit and bask in his presence. But I'm going to tell you, when you go throughout the Bible, and you see these times where culture was messed up, and lives were messed up, and God needed to raise up a generation that they didn't sit and just bask. They didn't just sit and take in. God called them for who they were, the dusty, gross-looking, gross-feeling people of God to go, I'm calling you to stand up. I'm calling you to go. And we go, I don't have anything to give. And God's response is, go in the strength you have. Everything that you need to do what God is calling you to do, you've already got. It's you plus God makes the miracle happen. The interesting thing about Gideon, and as we'll get into it in, in the weeks ahead, all Gideon had to do was be obedient. Anytime Gideon didn't know what to do, 
God showed up. Here's the game plan. Here's the path I've got. But you've got to be willing to walk it. You've got to be willing to go. We've got to be willing to get up out of the pew. And we've, we've got a first start. We've exited the building. We've made it this far. But church is meant to be more than just the Sunday morning experience. We are the church Monday through Saturday. Those are the days the greatest ministry should happen. Because God is sending you. God is sending you this morning. God is calling people this morning to deliver our community. To do something greater in our city. To reach the lost and to bring healing to the brokenhearted. The Bible says... The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. That calling, I believe, is on you this morning. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around. He's calling you, dusty, raggedy you, with all your problems, all your imperfections, God, I believe, is calling you this morning. You may feel like you have nothing to offer, but this morning, God isn't looking for your intellect. God isn't looking for your gifts and your talents. God is looking for the heart of a man or a woman who's just willing to say, I will follow you, Jesus. That's what he's looking for. That's who he needs this morning. That's who he's calling. I believe this morning there are people in this place, people watching online, people that are right here. God is calling you this morning. I know the preaching hasn't been that fancy today, but I've been obedient. And I believe even as I've said this, there is something that is pulling in some of you. And for, I'm not talking about every person here is called to be a pastor, a worship leader, or a missionary. But all of us should be called to our community and to take the gospel to our community. But I believe there's also some people here this morning that maybe God is calling you to full-time ministry. That there are future preachers and worship leaders and missionaries right here today that God would be stirring in you. This morning, we're going to have an altar call, and it's for this. It's not, it's not necessarily for the full-time ministry, but it's as far as pastors and missionaries are concerned. But you feel that God is calling you into a deeper relationship of obedience. You realize God is calling you to this community or your community where you live, and God is saying, I need a man or a woman who will follow me. And if you are willing to be obedient to the Lord this morning, I'm going to ask you to take a big step right now. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you to do this. Would you stand to your feet if God is calling you to a deeper level of obedience today? Thank you for acknowledging that. I believe there's more. God is calling this morning. He is looking for a generation to say, I'm willing to obey God. God, to let go of my fear, to let go of the unknown, and to say, God, I will go where you are calling me to go. I will be obedient to you. The amazing thing is, is God is chasing you today. He was chasing Gideon. He was after him. He had this amazing love for this guy who probably lacked love in his innermost being. He felt lost in the the middle of that wine press. But God abandoned all to reach out and confirm that he loved Gideon and that he wanted to do something greater in him. This morning before we pray, I'm going to ask Robbie to lead us in a worship song. Let's allow the Spirit of God to just call us this morning. Robbie, would you lead us in that song?
Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you bring your life to me. You have been.
I think one of the things that holds back a lot of believers from stepping into a deeper obedience level with God is that we want God to tell us what he wants us to do first. But I tell you something, God just doesn't work that way. God is looking for a heart of someone who says, I'm going to say yes to the Lord before he tells us what he wants us to necessarily do each and every day. None of these guys, none of these characters from the Bible had it all figured out or all mapped out. All of them struggled as they moved forward. But the things that defined them was their obedience to God. I believe today that God is calling for deeper obedience from our church, from the, from the church. Are you willing to go? Are we willing to surrender the things that we thought we knew to step into the unknown with God, to be able to reach people more effectively for the kingdom? Is, is Joey Bruss here? If he's around here, he needs to run up here really quick. If not, I can grab somebody else. But if he's here... He's coming? All right. I want to I wanna use Joey for this. Is he here? Joey? He's on his way. <laughs> He's like, if pastor's going to throw flour on me, I am not coming out there. <laughs> I just want to pray for you this morning. That I just believe God is calling you to a deeper place of obedience. A place where you've never been before. And God is saying, I'm sending you just the way you are. Just the way you are today. Because you and God, it's enough. It's enough at your workplace. It's enough in your neighborhood. It's enough in your community. But we've got to be willing to obey him when God says to let go, when God says to move, when God says, speaks to you about doing something to be able to wrestle through that and go, yes, Lord, I'm going to try this even though I feel inadequate, even though I feel like I'm not enough. I'm going to step into this and trust you. Because it's in those places that miracles happen. God, I believe you're calling us today to a deeper obedience than ever before. God, we see you doing things in the life of our church, specifically in the area of missions and the area of faith, in the area of proclaiming the gospel and, and stepping out and doing some things that are very different from where we were. Lord, if there's one thing that I have learned, it's that the season that you're in is prepping you for the seasons ahead. And God, the seasons you have ahead will, will, will have to have us take step of obedience to get there. It's not going to be enough to just sit and say we just want to take in. We've got to be willing to obey and step into the zone of miracles and say we're stepping out with our dusty old selves and the strength that we have because God, you have sent us. You have sent us to this community. You sent us to the surrounding communities, to our workplaces, to our schools, to our neighborhoods. And God, you are enough. Lord, help us to be obedient to you, even this week, that you would speak to us. In Jesus' mighty name. One last thing before we go into our last worship set tonight. Um, If you want to be obedient, one of the first things is to get baptized. The reason I, I've been so passionate about this this summer is not because I'm trying to pressure you, but I'm trying to get you to understand something. If you, are, if you aren't willing to get wet for Jesus and go, well, I find that embarrassing or I find that whatever it might be, whatever your drawback is to that, I don't want to be the first one or whatever it might be. If you're not willing to do that, how in the world are you possibly going to be able to do the things that God asks us to do that are really hard? And if you're like, well, I don't want to look silly. The pastor is up here covered in an entire bag of flour. Believe me, you will not be the silly one looking here this morning. But I would rather be obedient to God than anything else.
because that's where the blessings flow. So when we do this last worship set, if you feel like, you know what, I've got the tug to get water baptized today, would you just come find me over here? Uh, if you're a lady, I'm going to connect you with my wife. She's going to take you in to find clothes. We'll help you guys get everything that you need. We'll baptize you right here today. I want you to be able to take that step of obedience. One final thing before we go into worship. If I, I've got Joey Brussel over here. Come stand over here, Joey. I'm going to have you stand on this side of me. Because the amazing thing is, is we feel like we've got all this dust, all this baggage that we carry, all of our weakness and all those things. But there's another passage in Scripture. Because remember I told you when, the, when you're trying to get the chaff off wheat, that a breeze is important. And sometimes there's no breeze in our life. But we see in Acts chapter 2, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. And there is always a breeze with the Spirit of God. So all the dust that's on you, God will take care of that over time. He's powered up and able to remove a lot of that stuff. in your life. But we've got to be willing to be obedient and follow him. Woo. Thank you, Joey. Is a good word for today, church? Hey, let's do this. It's the holiday weekend. I'm going to have Robbie uh, lead us in just a couple of patriotic songs to remember that God wants to bless our nation. He wants to bless you over this holiday. If you want to get baptized, uh, come see me afterwards. Uh, Robbie, I'm going to have you close the service in prayer today and dismiss everybody. But guys, I love you so much. I can't wait for next Sunday. We're going to go deeper into Gideon. We're going to have a great time. I hope you have a great holiday. Can we stand as we sing these patriotic songs together? the beautiful
Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of death are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. God. Thank you for the freedoms that you have given to us as Americans. God, I'm so thankful to be here in America. But Lord, I'm more thankful for your grace and your mercy that you extend to us. Lord, I pray that as we go our separate ways and spend time with family and friends over this July 4th holiday, God, remind us of your love and your grace and your mercy and that you have called each one of us to a specific task. God, may we worship you and do it with all of our heart. Thank you for each person here. Be with them as they go. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.